Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Campus Consortium's Ed Talks I Seminar, featuring Purdue University. In today's presentation, we will focus on groundbreaking engagement strategies to drive enrollment in higher ed. Our presenters include Ms. Christina Wong Davis, who serves as the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management at Purdue University, and Annie Hugh, Vice President, Community Engagement at Campus Consortium. We will take questions at the end of today's presentation that have been typed into the chat box or questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. Without further ado, please allow me to present Ms. Hugh and Ms. Davis. Over to you, Ms. Hugh. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor for us to have Christina present for us today. For those who joined us uh, today, Christina Wong Davis serves as the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management at Purdue University. In her role, she provides leadership to the areas of admissions, financial aid, the registrar, and enrollment analysis and reporting. During her career, she has held positions at a number of other public universities at the University of California, San Diego, Wong Davis served as the Director of Admissions, where she worked to expand the number of California residents on campus and improve diversity. While the Ohio State University, she provided leadership as Director of Recruitment and Outreach, overseeing local, national, and international efforts to grow and diversify enrollment for the Ohio State. Additionally, Wong Davis served in many capacities with University of Arizona, including roles in admission, alumni, and early academic outreach. As a higher education professional, she served in roles with the ACT State Organization in California and the Midwest Regional Council for the College Board. I would like to thank Christina for taking out time for us today to provide us with these critical insights. And uh, I'd like to proudly present Christina Wong Davis. Christina, over to you. A few insights. Um, with all of our attendees today, um, I'll go ahead and move into the, the presentation, but I would say, let me couch this by, I don't know how groundbreaking any strategies are, because for all intents and purposes, I think we all have different strategies that work for our institutions in our own ways. So maybe more of what I would talk about is really the framework for how we get our jobs done in enrollment management. So given that, I think it, it helps to frame the environment of what we have going on in higher education today. And this is evolving even as I speak, depending on what's happening with the federal government and our political environment and our economic environment. Environment. There's so many influences that drive what those hot topics are. But really, we're seeing a range of things like I have listed here. We're becoming more and more sensitive to student outcomes and accountability to those, whether it's retention or graduation rates. What does it mean to have student success on our campus? What is that definition and what does it look like? Because our operations really do feed what success looks like for the entire institution. But on top of that, we have to think about all of the elements that we impact, space planning, IT, administrative costs. And in line with that, how do we share data? What are our revenue streams? Where are there savings that could be had? Those are all topics that are driving our institutions and also elements that we feed into as an enrollment operation within any institution. So when we think about what the current state of enrollment management itself is, there are a number of things that I think we're all really deeply aware of and that more and more institutions are really having to take a look at what it means to meet our enrollment targets. Out of 200 public and private institutions, about 47% of institutions in our country indicated that they didn't meet their enrollment targets. And so with over 4,000 institutions in the U.S., that's almost 2,000 institutions that didn't make enrollment targets. And for the fall of 2016, the Student Clearinghouse reported that about 270,000 students demonstrated enrollment declines or enrollment dropped by 270,000 students. So that's enrollment declines across 39 states. We know that we have fewer and fewer students graduating from high school, and that is not going to rebound in the next few coming even 10 years. 
And so what are we doing as institutions to understand what that landscape is going to be coming down the road? And so, you know, the other statistic I have there at the, the bottom is that universities are growing at a slow rate, but net price continues to increase. And so what's that doing to the position of some of our students who can't afford higher education? to begin conversations we're having within the profession and at our institutions. So what are those pressures that we're faced with as we make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis? We're familiar with these. What's happening with our out-of-state markets? So as a country, if our high school demographic isn't growing, but yet so many of us are recruiting out of state, we're also more or less stealing from one another. And inter international markets, what's happening in currency markets, devaluation of some currencies that we, might be feeder markets for us, politically what's happening in those markets and how those might fluctuate from year to year for us. Really importantly, and being talked about more and more, is the transfer population and bringing in students who are starting at community colleges. What do those partnerships and articulations look like? But then wrapping all that back in with the data-driven piece. So how do we use the ability and technology around looking at advertising ROI, evaluating events, and understanding how we can leverage social media and brand awareness with technology today to understand where our markets are and where interest is. Also, where some of those consumers who we don't see face-to-face -face every day are telling us that their interest is so that we're not always having to be in a one-on-one -on -one conversation to try and glean where the marketplace is with respect to what we're delivering in higher education. Some more pressures, of course, as I mentioned, with tuition going up and inflation also going up at the same time, what's happening between pricing and financial aid at our institutions? How do we optimize revenue models? And many institutions are on different revenue type models, whether it's an RCM or a central uh, model then coming that, bringing that back home into thinking about what we do with our financial aid and scholarship strategies to align with supporting students, either being that we want to supply more merit-based aid to bring in highly talented non-resident students or more need-based aid to support our in-state residents very important to a public institution and all the publics I've ever worked for, that's a very important piece. But then how do you also undergird a culture of financial literacy and debt counseling? One of our real central tenets here at Purdue is to reduce the overall de debt of our student body, especially our undergraduate students. And how do we help them to understand what it means to take on debt around an undergraduate degree in particular, so that they're knowledgeable in the choices they make. In particular, thinking about how much debt a non-resident student would be taking on in coming here and making sure that they're well informed about that decision-making process. At the same time, yield is always part of the discussion because non-residents, for many of us, yield at a lower rate. How do we make sure we're yielding the students we want in all of our degree programs? and engaging the campus in that. It's really not just the responsibility of enrollment management to bring the right students to our campus, but how do we also help to inform our campus partners in that, be it faculty or staff, to attract those students and make the value proposition of our campus as they make their decisions. And then anti-melt strategies. We were very successful last summer. We were concerned here at Purdue about yield for international students being soft. And I think that was something that we were seeing nationally with many of our colleagues. And so knowing that, we really employed some deep anti-melt strategies with many of our international students that went a long way. We actually overperformed in that vein and had more international students enrolled than we expected because we really hedged off some of the melt that we were worried about having. So that ended up being a great story and something I think we will continue to think about going forward for all of our student demographics 
even if we don't meet the yield we want, we can also work on what we do with those students over summer. Future pressures coming down the line, we already talked about kind of what's happening demographically nationally, but another important topic that we're faced with in higher education, we don't always have the means to change, is the preparation of students in K-12 too. So while there might be a declining population coming out of K-12, how do we end up and engage in the conversations to support improving the bar for success in K-12 so that those students are poised and positioned if they so choose to go into higher education? And as we already briefly touched on, how do we connect retention and completion to what we're doing in enrollment management to ensure that we are continuing to be accountable and demonstrate that our students are successful? And what does it mean to in de develop some of those success indicators in our recruitment funnels so that we can identify those students and work with them throughout the process of recruitment and enrollment? And again, we touched on this, but we keep coming back to this conversation in enrollment management about marketing and communications and how do you weave some of that technology that we have available at our fingertips into informing our process, whether it's looking at our web statistics, whether it's developing new content that is more in sync with how the younger generation consumes information today. So many times our younger consumers look for information in different ways than we're used to delivering it. So how do we reframe and reshape those marketing and PR and even our websites in a way that doesn't speak to what we need to see out there, but speaks to what our younger students need to see as they're researching and thinking about coming to our institution and continuing the demand forecasting. That's something that we've all been doing for a while but continuing to look at deeper and deeper segmentation analysis, understanding how fluid some neighborhoods and some states are, some cities are, where are their employer demands that overlap with what students seem to be interested in, and or where are their new employer movements in areas that we might want to think about as academia. How can we move into areas where there aren't as many degree programs? How can we guide students into possible new professions coming down the road. I'll talk about that more in a bit because I think that's one area where we have a lot to, of groundwork to make up in higher education. We haven't spent as much time historically, but given the environment that we're in and the way that technology is driving the professions today and what people are doing in their professional workplace is so different, we really could reshape some things in higher education to be more dynamic. Some additional future pressures, continuing to think about what we can do to optimize capacity, whether that's thinking about how we bring in transfer students strategically because they demand different resources than freshmen, but also thinking about capacity analysis by delivery mode, by academic areas, by being dynamic. One of the elements that we're working on here at Purdue are three-year liberal arts degrees, really guided and targeted at that student who knows they're going to go on to grad school, knows that they already have a plan to go to law school or medical school, some type of program after their bachelor's degree, and they're really targeted and focused, and working through that bachelor's degree in three years is no problem for them. So thinking about how you target different demographics to move them through in a different way than you have historically. And then thinking about our skill set in enrollment management. What does our data analytics need to move us forward? What kind of infrastructure do we need? One of the elements that we're discussing here more and more at Purdue is even deeper modeling than we've had in the past. How can we use some more predictive modeling to help us plan for enrollment management in the future? We touch on the marketing, social media, continuing to stay ahead of where social media is moving and which elements of social media will students engage with us in. Because there are some elements they will and other elements they won't, or over time those evolve and how do we maintain an evolution with that. Continual financial mod modeling, 
transparency on campus I can't speak enough about, and I'll come back to that again in a few minutes, but making sure we continue to reinform our entire campus about these elements and, and educating the academy is part of that because we expect everybody to understand the parameters of current pressures and future pressures that we're working with, but that's not the world they live in. So how do we use our knowledge to help all of campus to understand what the environment is that we're working in to enroll students? So that really brings us to one of the most central tenants that we're faced with in enrollment is developing some strategic enrollment planning. And so many times what happens at a campus is they bring together a group, they develop a plan, it's bound, it's set on a shelf, it's forgotten about. Two years later, it's collected dust and we dust it off. But this is really a dynamic strategic enrollment plan that I'm talking about. It's thinking about what's realistic and quantifiable for the institution, thinking about what real return on investment is, not just direct revenue, but what are costs associated with each kind of enrollment, and can the institution really deliver on what it would take to invest in that kind of enrollment function. And then always aligning the institution's mission with where we're at in the current state and the changing environment. For instance, we're a land-grant institution here at Purdue, so we always have to assess as we're talking about different enrollment targets, different goals, where we want to be as an institution with whether or not that aligns with us as a land-grant institution. And then thinking about what it means to define ourselves as a land-grant institution in this country, in the global economy, in the global environment, and so it takes all of these elements that we're struggling with in enrollment management and wraps them back around to ensuring that we're encompassing all aspects of the institution as we plan for what we should look like as a university based on enrollment. So first and foremost, if we haven't set the clear number for and goals for types of students, what that means, how it aligns with the institutional mission, we're already going to struggle to meet our enrollment goals. So if we start with first aligning the types of students we need, who they are, what they look like, and where that's going to take us as an institution, then we can start to focus on what that means for student success, access, retention, graduation. How do all of those elements wrap into what that long-term goal is and how those all align. And then thinking about once we know all those pieces, how do we effectively plan for what it would mean to support those students with either merit-based or need-based aid? Do we need additional fundraising? Do we need some additional institutional dollars for need aid? And how would we package that to support whatever those goals are? And so continuing to wrap each piece as we take another step, ensuring all the while that as we do that, we have the data support involved to assess and reassess and reinform our decisions continually. So you're starting to get the theme that this is a continual process. It's not a plan that sits on a shelf and collects dust but rather that we're continuing to reevaluate and reassess these items. So the data environment in which we establish all of what we're doing is really, really important because we have to reinform decisions constantly. The process for organization and financial efficacy, of course, is what we all as an institution and as enrollment managers are trying to do. We're undergirding the financial viability of our institutions with ensuring we have the enrollment necessary to be a viable operation. We want to make sure at all times we're student-centered. I don't think I've seen a university out there who doesn't in some way say that they're student-centered, but what does that mean? We have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to offer top quality student-centered service in this environment, in this realm, in the context of everything we've talked about? And what kind of financial supports does that require? What does it mean to deliver on that kind of service for our students? What kind of service do we need to ensure graduation and retention rates for all students, not just some? And then make sure that with all of those contexts in place, that we communicate that across campus. 
and we being an entire group of cross-sectional campus individuals who really work with all of these questions that I've just posed because it can't be just a few people who are deciding all of these elements. It needs to take into account what all the departments, all of the elements of campus really must do to support the strategic plan. And so essentially what we're really trying to do as an organization is take our institution from whatever our current state is, whether it's a struggling current state, whether it's a current state that's in a great place but still needs to move forward, whatever that looks like, we're trying to move to some desired enrollment state. And at any given point of time, that's a very fluid thing. So we might always be modeling and changing and realigning what that desired enrollment state might be. But the enrollment plan is the framework in which we're trying to get that done. So we use that information culture to begin informing the process, continue informing the process, and then realigning strategies. Strategies are never static. They really need to be tweaked at any given time, reassessed and redeployed to ensure that we're going in the right direction. Our markets change as enough these days that I think we're, we're really not well served even a year out if we don't reassess all of our strategies. And then current, continuing to develop the essential frameworks, that should have been frameworks that got cut off, to continue through this process. It's really an evolutionary process that we're talking about. And so as we consider all of those elements, another piece of creating this plan and working with our campus is to do a real external review of marketing realities or market realities. And this is where I get back to talking about what's happening in the employment sector. So often enrollment management never engages with employers. And we don't sit down and talk to those individuals in our career center and say, what is it that employers are coming to our institution asking for? Who are they looking for in the kinds of students that we're producing? And how can we help build an enrollment strategy and plan that will provide those kinds of students who will then go on to be employable by all of those companies who are coming to us? And so if they're also seeing that there are new types of jobs coming on the market. How are those changing and evolving that will tell us the kinds of skills and abilities that our students need to come out of our institution with? Even if that means new degree programs, redesigned degree programs, in terms of being able to ensure that we're making changes at the same place that companies and the industries around us are making changes. And then looking at our institutional realities in line with that. So do we have some degree programs that really aren't aligning with those market realities anymore? Are they simple curricular changes? Are they broader curricular changes we need to make? Are there things that we need to rethink about in the types of experiences our students are getting in those contexts that would help them as well, given an internship, multiple internships, co-ops, have we not embedded enough of those kinds of elements in our programs to make sure we're meeting the market realities? And then having those conversations, not only in our own group as enrollment management, academic elements to that, so that we think about how we position both our pipeline of students and also our pipeline of alums who are going out into the workplace. And then the bottom line there is, do we make sure that we budget for as an institution on a realistic enrollment model, or are we over optimistic in our enrollment model? And part of that, I continue to struggle with in my own place and many of my colleagues and I have had this conversation because we as institutions, many times you see the press releases every fall, this institution had growing enrollments, this institution has a landmark number of incoming freshmen, but if we have a declining population in this country and we're continuing to see a downturn in enrollment from international students, when is that breaking point and how do we budget based on knowing that we might hit that tipping point 
where we won't continue to see those huge enrollment go targets and growth anymore. So as we were talking about and talking about data, thinking about what kind of data we need to shore up our process, these are a couple of the pockets of data that are really central to having these conversations. Market demand, again, much like I was talking about market reality, but how do we pull in some real data points around what's being demanded out there? Not just where students are indicating interest on the PSAT and SAT, but how does that align with where students are really getting employed in the workplace? One of the conversations we're having and continue to have is where are our students going? And if a student who has an engineering degree is not employed in engineering, what are they doing in their work field? And what does that look like? Likewise, where are those students who don't have engineering degrees that are now employed in engineering firms? What are they doing and what does that look like? So that we can then align what we're doing with the realities of market demand and where students are finding their work lives. The idea of unoccupied market positions is something that higher ed hasn't always adapted to and differentiation. How do we articulate what our experience is that is different from every other institution? And on the surface for an 18 year old, even a 19 and a 20, year old. Sometimes that's hard to consume. How do you understand how different one institution is and that degree program is from another institution? So collecting data about where your students are going and what's available to them, where you can align your institution with an unoccupied market position is really important in helping to define some of that differentiation. And then being realistic about authenticity. What do you do well as an institution? What can we do well as Purdue? And what don't we do well? And I'm completely open and I would support all of my professionals in my organization to articulate when we don't do something well with a student. We don't tell students to come here for degree programs that we just don't do as strongly in if they're a very strong student and could it be admitted to a really strong institution in a certain area, we want to have those realistic conversations. Along that same line, authenticity comes back to financial aid. We should articulate to our non-resident high need students that we are not going to be able to give them a financial aid need package that will help them to meet all unmet need. Realistically, we wouldn't want a student to be set up for financial failure as much as anything else. And so having those real upfront and authentic conversations with ourselves so we understand who we are as an institution and then being able to have those with all of our constituencies is really important. So part of taking the strategic and enrollment plan and wrapping it back into campus is to then working with our academic planning progress process so that the enrollment plan aligns with what we're doing as an institution. So one of the programs that might be coming online, we need to think about if a college or a department is planning a new program, could we actually deliver on new students in that program? Is there a market out there for students interested in this kind of degree program, in this kind of experience? It would be very important to ensure that the strategic enrollment plan aligns with that. Also thinking about, and this is a really interesting conversation we continue to have here at Purdue, what does it mean to have face-to-face in-classroom teaching versus online teaching? And how do you begin to marry those two? Our student body today is more and more comfortable in online spaces, and they adapt very well to delivery of content online. Many of our classes will now deliver lectures online, and then the in-classroom is really more of a discussion point where students come with their misunderstandings from what was delivered online, their questions as they grapple with content, and so it's less lecture and more interaction with the professor because the 
content is being delivered differently. And what does that mean for cost? What does that mean for changing how the program's delivered in the future? And capacity is always a driver. And how does that overlap with being able to deliver some things online, create new capacity where we hadn't had capacity before, especially for programs where there's high demand? How do you take a program with high demand and create capacity, should you create capacity is an important discussion point and should be informed by the enrollment planning process too. But also, if you can create per capacity, where does that overlap with your new programs? Where does that overlap with the potential to deliver some content, maybe online or in different formats? Take it outside of your traditional thinking of a lecture and then test and lecture and test kind of model. And so building in all of those elements to thinking about what the enrollment looks like if you start to make those shifts and how do we continue to feed enrollment with a changing academic environment. And oftentimes there aren't many sunsets in higher education. We want to hold on to what programs we feel are traditionally the baselines of our institution. But sunsets can and do happen. And when they need to happen, how do we inform that process? How do we ensure that we're making sure that we've made the right decision as an institution? Because that does impact, it impacts students. Alums hate to see certain programs go away. Donors will often give to keep programs around, but we need to make sure we've made the right decision when we decide to sunset things at an institution. So essentially what we're talking about is a continuous improvement cycle for enrollment planning, also for campuses. We're in an environment anymore where our society and our culture is dynamic enough and technology is moving at such a high rate that higher education now has to try to start to keep up. That involves metrics and reporting and being more dynamic, keeping up that analysis and understanding of all of those elements that are surrounding us, model and planning, but taking action with all of this, not allowing all of this information to build up and then being stagnated by not knowing what to do, continually reanalyzing but never taking action. We have to keep the process up and keep moving forward, but remember to keep informing, whether that's our campus, our constituents, our students, all at the same time. So some takeaway items from all of these thoughts. I don't think we can ever get away anymore in higher education or in enrollment management that data is critical to what we do, whether it's simple reporting data and year-to-year -year assessment or whether it's really thinking about deep modeling. One of the elements that we're working on here at Purdue is how do we model projected growth for specific classes. How many seats do we need in a specific class if we do this? What if analysis modeling? And it's actually very complicated to do all the way down to the class level. But something like that can really drive what we do with facilities, how we build out facilities, how much we need to spend on facilities in the future. So that data undergirding is so essential to being able to support the health and the strength of campus. Also, we really talked about this quite a bit, but the market demand, and I can't say enough about competition because we're all trying to achieve those same things for all of our institutions, growing our enrollment, getting the best and brightest and most diverse student body, and knowing that each one of us are trying to do that, understanding where our niche market is against all of our competitors and positioning ourselves in a strategic way within those markets. And then academic co-curricular development, we talked about staying a part of that process as an enrollment manager so that we can inform how those do or do not align with their strategic enrollment plan. Because essentially, at the end of the day, we're trying to ensure that our success is based on student success overall, graduating having alums who are employable, having alums who are successful in their employment is really what our work is supposed to be. So at the end of the day, like I said, strategic enrollment planning never ends. 
So what we're talking about is a process where our job is never finished. If it does, we should be working ourselves out of a job. But because marketplaces change, our environment changes, higher ed landscape changes, our job will never be done because it's really up to us to help the institution reposition based on enrollment pressures to be, become what we need to be, to be financially viable and academically viable as we move into the future. So with that, I wanna make sure, that, sure we're leaving time for plenty of questions. I will turn it over to questions. Thank you, Christina, for the great insight. Uh, and of course, we do have a couple of questions from you. We gathered them before the I seminar for some of the folks that joined us today. So one of the questions that came in through our survey report was, if schools don't have, a, have data-driven strategies, what's an easy first step they can take to start measuring the impact of their initiatives? So I would say one of the first ways any institution can start to, to measure some impact and it depends on what they're trying to measure initially, whether it's in the admissions office. Starting with that initial funnel data, looking at how many prospects do they have, how many applicants did they have, how many of those applicants were in the prospect pool, and then of those applicants, how many were admitted and how many enrolled. So tracking down through the funnel how successful they were just in a single given year not having to do a longitudinal comparison or even year to year even just doing that simple analysis for one year is good if it's in a financial aid office looking at how many financial aid offers were given to students and of those students how many accepted and how many are enrolled so again looking at that funnel and how impactful were decisions throughout the pipeline is a great place to start making some of those data informed decisions about how did you perform within the context of influencing decisions, helping students, and where might there be gaps or where might there be further data questions that are drawn out by looking at some of that initial analysis. Those often drive additional data questions that you can then begin to dig into. Thank you, Christina, for answering that. It was very, very insightful. Another question that, another question that we gathered was, uh, understanding that the holistic approach seems to be vital to the success of the program, can you cite traits that successful enrollment management programs use to engage other parts of the infrastructure to fully commit to the overall strategy? So I really think, in, in every instance, institution's organizational structure looks a little bit different. Everybody functions slightly different, but the most critical responsibility of any enrollment manager, I think, is building relationships. We have to build relationships with our academic colleagues, and that's throughout the pipeline. So I interface regularly, not just with deans on my campus, but with the advising staff in the colleges, with the associate deans. They all have different decision-making elements, and they both influence decisions differently. So it's important for me to know where each one of them are coming from and to inform each one of those constituencies at the same time I am endlessly in conversations with our provost, with our president, with our treasurer, also making sure that I inform all of those decision-making individuals on our campus about the context in which they might be thinking about making a decision and the realities in which we're faced with making decisions. Thank you, Christina. I think a counter question to that was, how do you motivate your team of admission counselors? Growing enrollment is great, but do you use any internal tactics to keep the team focused on reaching the goal line? Sure. So especially at this time of year when they're all buried reading tons of applications and every year the application pools increase, so they're reading more and more applications, it can definitely be challenging. And I think one of the things that we're really faced with every year, year in, year out, is how do you build camaraderie within your admissions team so that they can look to their left, look to their right, know that their colleagues are doing the same thing, and find support in that. Taking some time out just to do something fun in the middle of a work day, whether we have just a quick coffee hour and everyone sits around, laughs, tells stories, whether it's about the applications they're reading or not, and just catches their breath. Also, having continual meetings with those staff members to be transparent. I want them to understand 
all of the conversations that are happening on campus so they see how their work aligns with how the campus is moving forward. They don't feel isolated in that way. They feel connected to the bigger picture. Really is important to helping them feel motivated. And then most of all, I give them all the credit. When we have successes, it's not me. I didn't have the success. I had success because we have great staff. And so ensuring that they understand that their work is so deeply valued and that they're recognized for that, I think is central to making sure they continue year in, year out to be motivated, especially when the job gets bigger and bigger every year. Thank you, Christina. We have another question again from the audience. I think they're just getting really smart and <laughs> giving you more. So the question is, retention is a major concern for institutions these days. Most of the institutions are facing a major dilemma about whether they should focus on increasing enrollment or retaining the existing students. What do you do in this kind of a situation? Sure, that is a very important question, and I think the two have to go hand in hand. So part of, if you're thinking about why you might not have the retention you need, is to dig into who are the students who aren't retaining and why. Are there some real corollary developments in the data that you can see that there's certain students who aren't retaining? Is it a non-resident pocket of students? Are there students in certain majors who are retaining at a lower rate? Are there students from certain demographics, like low income or first generation students, who are retaining at a lower rate? Those are important questions to ask and start to answer because they also inform your enrollment plan. So if I'm bringing in students and then I look and I see that we're losing them after the first year or after the second year, then I need to think about how do we realign what we're doing in enrollment management to ensure that we're not feeding students in who aren't going to be successful and at the same time having conversations with my academic colleagues and student life colleagues around the supports that are necessary for some students if there is a theme indeed that we can identify. Part of it too is sometimes as you dig into that data, you might see we're having a retention issue in one degree program and take a look at that curriculum. There might be some curricular issues where there's a caustic alignment of certain courses all in one semester that really defeat a student. And is there a way to realign some of those courses in a way that will pace that out just a little bit more for students and allow them to digest it more reasonably and not really kind of intimidate and disenfranchise them? And so I think there are a lot of elements and aligned with retention that we can ask ourselves, but some of it does come back to enrollment management. So I don't think you decouple that conversation. Thank you, Christina, for answering that. And I think this is the last question for the day. I'm not going to tax you too much. But a lot of people are asking us about international student recruitment. What kind of strategies are you driving at Purdue to promote international student recruitment, uh, given that there are so many criteria that one needs to apply through or to go go through a lot of tests to get through. So how do you churn out uh, the students that need to be on campus? So we've had a lot of success with bringing in international students at Purdue. And so what we're really focused on right now is making sure that we have the diversity of students in our international pool that we want. And by that, I mean geographic diversity, that we're, we don't have students all representing one nationality in our international pool and that we have a diversity of academic interests in our international students so that we don't end up with just one major where all of our international students are living. We want them to take part in all of campus. And so how do we align what we're doing internationally with what we want them to experience on campus. We do have a very global recruitment effort. We're in a lot of countries. We work very closely with high school counselors abroad to ensure that they understand the breadth of offerings that we have at Purdue. But more importantly, and I think this is really critical and it's part of that anti-melt strategy that I talked about, we work a lot with international student families. We understand that the family is an important element in this process. And how do we help parents, students, guardians abroad 
to understand what this process is going to look like, whether it's taking the IELTS, taking the TOEFL exam, preparing for an SAT abroad, and then matriculating in to become a student in an environment where they might not be comfortable right now and making that transition. And so we end up building really strong networks with those families. They come to campus. We have an international orientation program as part of our Boiler Gold gold rush where we bring the international families with the students. They come in with their students and have two days of intensive orientation alongside their students so that they can also adapt to what it means for their student to be in higher education here in the U.S. and give their student the right kind of support that they need over the next four years of their college career. Thank you so much, Christina. Once again, uh, we'll reach towards the end of our session. This is the last Ed Talk for the year, so we're glad to have you, and it's an honor for us to have you present uh, enrollment strategies so that everybody can, you know, go buy the books for next year and be prepared to handle the best. We've got a lot of uh, folks wanting the slides and recording for today's presentation. For So for those who missed out a bit or want to catch up later on what Christina said, uh, the slides will be available on our website along with a recording of this webinar. You would also be sent an email as a follow-up uh, with the details of uh, where you need to go and look up the webinar. Right, I'm going to quickly move presenter controls over to us so that I can quickly go to the last few slides that we have. So, of course, like I said, this is the last segment of our iSeminar for 2017. We're going to come back next year with a whole new set of uh, uh, webinars on, uh, and Ed Talks especially on specific topics. If you want to recommend anyone or send us more details, you could do, it, do that at info at campusconsortium.org. We also believe in relive our mission every year in reducing the cost of education. We awarded more than 10 million in grants this year. We've got more than 75 institutions that were all awarded the grant program. So it's been a success for campus and for the institutions throughout the year. We've got some big names coming over as well. So uh, once again, for those institutions who love campus, you want to know more about campus, please visit our event site, go through our grant programs, they're interactive, they'll really help you. Again, our, cost, our, our mission is to reduce the cost of education and um, people like Christina, uh, Philip Long and a lot many more add value to the consortium and community engagement of driving this through. Once again, Christina, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining in. This is Annie Hughes signing off from Chicago. Have a great day. Bye-bye.